All right, hello and welcome to Reimagine 2021. This is our ninth conference and a monthly series of events bringing you nothing but the best projects, bright minds and leaders in the space. We've been fortunate enough to invite many talented individuals and teams to come speak with us providing updates, insights and all the above that's happening in, uh, in crypto. Um, so we've had themed events every month. We've been doing this for a year. Uh, we've had What the Fi is DeFi, we've had Tales from the Crypto, Happy Hodl Days, Happy Hodl Days, NFTs, um, and everything in between. And so we're super excited on our ninth event, going pretty strong, very fortunate to have guests come and, and, and support us here. Uh, so the theme of this conference really is around Game of Chains, Battle for the Throne. And ultimately, it's a concept like there's so many blockchains out there, the pros, the cons, you know, the communities, the advantages of developing on one or the other. And we're going to highlight that today. And, and today we're, we're actually um, supported by Algorand. Um, they've been, you know, a supporter of us for, for a while now, and then they're sponsoring this event and not only this event, this panel, and really the funds go right back to our university program and the production quality of this to, to bring this to our viewers and audience internationally. So I'll be your host today, Adam from the Mouseball team, where we focus on early stage investments to our accelerator and providing development support to a number of growing projects, as well as education within the university, within the Mouseball university program. Um, our main objective and goals are pretty simple, simple and straightforward. It's increasing adoption, use cases, and real-world applications. So I'll go ahead and stop talking because uh, I feel like I've been talking too much already. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, introduce our, our panel here. Super stoked to, to, to have you guys participate. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Uh, Aaron, we'll start with you. Um, thank you for joining. Give us a little intro on, on, on your uh, spot in crypto. Hi, Adam, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Aaron Jackson. I'm a product management lead. Um, for Cantina Consulting, an innovation and consulting agency in Boston. And by way of Reach and Algorand, we've been spinning up an NFT marketplace product that we're happy and excited to release um, in the next month. Awesome, awesome. Look, looking forward to chatting about that during this discussion. Thank you for joining. Uh, Addy, how you doing? Uh, thanks for joining. Give us a little- Yeah, energy. thanks for having me. Um, Hey, I'm Addy Wagonick. I'm uh, the Director of Ecosystems and Technical Operations for the Algorand Foundation. Um, I look at everything from project viability to um, technical deployments and NFTs. Awesome. Awesome. What's going on, Chris? Uh, how are you doing? Thanks, thanks for joining. My pleasure. Um, my name is Chris Swinner. Uh, I'm the CEO of Reach. Uh, Reach is... Reach's mission is to actually uh, simultaneously lower the bar of entry for developers into the blockchain space, but also raise the potential for experts because we don't we don't want to just make it easier for developers to come in and you know build toys. Um, we also empower experts to actually build things better than what we've already seen. Awesome, awesome, and, and uh, everybody's touching on something that's very critical. Addy, ecosystem growth. Super important developer relations, super important, Chris, making sure that, you know, the resources and tools are available and Aaron, you know, applying it, <laughs> using it, building something um, in kind of this, the, the pace of innovation, right, is, is happening so fast. So, like, as I mentioned in the intro, um, we have a lot of uh, base layers, layer ones, layer twos coming on. And not only that, the, the, the ecosystem projects that are building on that network and we're, we're highlighting you know, what the decisions made to choose one chain over another, and there's a lot of, you know, variables involved. But for this specific panel, we're all kind of developing on Algorand. We'd love to kind of get your thoughts here. We have viewers tuning in, students, uh, developers, like exploring what chain to develop on, like why, the purpose. Um, and there's some chains out there that have hurdles and, and, and challenges. Um, anyway, so let, let's kind of educate them. Um, Let's start with uh, Addy. I don't know. Let, let's go to some of the key. I don't know benefits to develop on Algorand or like what what do you think drives your user base to come to Algorand? I know you know you guys don't compromise on security, decentralization, like scalability aspects. Um, from your perspective, like what does Al Algorand offer? I mean, so I came to Algorand from another really established layer one, and what drew me to Algorand was the research teams and the product teams are thinking five to 10 years ahead where other chains are thinking very much about now and they're reactionary. Um, our cryptographers and our researchers and our core developers are really thinking about the implications of, um, you know, post-quantum 
computational is issues with cryptographic hashes and kind of these larger long-term questions that will really make or break the sustainability and the scalability of the chain. So I was quite impressed by how forward thinking they were. I think from a developer standpoint, um, Chris, can, Chris and or Aaron can probably speak to that more, but um, definitely our developer documents are really clear. We have a really robust Discord uh, community that's pretty much always around to answer questions. Uh, and we have multiple SDKs to build out on, which is really great. I came from a chain which was primarily developing out on Rust, so everyone had to learn Rust. And and here you have the benefit of you know multiple different SDKs to choose from. Awesome, awesome. And what are your thoughts, Chris? I mean, you're working pretty close with the onboarding. And, and one of my questions, and maybe we'll just, maybe it ties into it, it's like, how do we onboard developers, right? Like we're, we're trying to get uh, Web 2.0 devs, you know, existing devs into the space. We have people looking at career changes, trying to get into the space. We have developers, in general, developers are very experimental and want to like challenge and build things and, and, and go after it. Um, so what are your thoughts in terms of like some of the key benefits to developing on Algorand? So yeah, so it, it's it's a very interesting question, especially when you look at reach and algorithms. Um, the reason why I say that is that my belief always is what what protocols are good at are the the speed, the security, the decentralization, and that's what they're really really good at. Um, what they shouldn't have to care about is onboarding developers. They should allow for um, developers to be able to just choose which consensus layer, which protocol actually best fits their needs. Um, and that's really what Reach's uh, goal is, is that we want to actually even the playing field so that a developer can actually learn Reach and then choose whichever platform is the best for their product. They, they shouldn't have to worry about learning a new platform. They shouldn't, like Addy said, they, they shouldn't have to learn Rust or something else. So they, can, they just know one thing and um, through a configuration change, they launch on whatever chain they want. And that's what Reach provides. Why the actual excitement uh, with actual the partnership with the integration with Algorand is that um, the thing that they really excel at is that consensus layer, is that that network layer. Um, and now because of the reach partnership, they don't have to worry about building an amazing onboarding um, platform because we can handle that. So now a developer can come in, build on reach with all of the tools that we, um, I mean, I I believe in what our developers have already said, we've solved the, the problem with, with onboarding to blockchain. Um, and now they can launch on one of the best, if not the best uh, consensus layer without having to worry about any type of hurdles or hoops to actually jump through. Um, so it's kind of like a, the way that I look at it is that the, it's, there's a blockchain stack involved and the, the protocols that are trying to actually take on the entire st stack, they don't, there's not enough people in the entire world. So um, I, I see it as a layered thing where we'll take our, on the onboarding and then the consensus layers, the protocols take care of providing the, the features that, that are truly needed. And, and can you provide some examples of, of what this tooling or infrastructure that, that it reaches building to enable sure. developers to not have to worry about some of the underlying yeah. you know, pro protocol, like the core protocol development stuff? Yeah. So traditionally, when you like ignoring reach, uh, when you're a developer, there's a, a big hurdle to when coming over to the blockchain space. Number one is decentralized development rather than centralized. So it's like there's a lot of distributed computing that you kind of have to wrap your head around. But the other thing is you have to know, know how to build a state machine. Um, traditional developers really don't think at that low level. Um, and by thinking at that low level, there's a lot of things that, that developers take for granted that um, if you don't remember, you will fail. You will leave a hole in your application and people will take all of your, your money and all of your users' money and you will go cry for the rest of your life. Um, that is the, the current situation with blockchain development. What Reach does is it, it provides a programming language that is a higher level of abstraction that takes care of all of the nitty gritty th things, all of what we like to say, the boring things that you really shouldn't have to care about. You should have, all you should have to really care about is what you want your application to do not make sure that you satisfied every timeout condition and um, every runtime verification and um, everything of that, that sort. You should just, as a developer, sit down, write your application, hit compile, let the compiler tell you um, how many holes are in your application, and just go from there. 
you shouldn't have to get your PhD in computer science to be able to uh, to program your application. And that is the situation that currently is out there with blockchain. We cut, we lost audio. Yeah, Adam. Sorry. No problem. I uh, can't see the, the light. Um, so yeah, no, well, one of the critical aspects right there, what, what you're talking about um, really is just being able to let developers develop and, and innovate and onboard pretty seamlessly. Um, at one point, right, one of the catchphrases, taglines of the industry was uh, build it and they will come. And that's not kind of necessarily the case so much. Uh, you can have the best tech and, and, and maybe no community. Uh, you can have no you know, resources, educational content, you know, all the above. Um, Aaron, I want to get your thoughts real quick in terms of kind of what they're providing. And you're, you're on the other end of it. You're actually uh, applying, you know, using the technology. What was the reason to develop on Algorand? And then how has it worked out for you in terms of actually building a marketplace? And you could talk about the marketplace as well. Great. Yeah, I think I think at a high level, you know, we've always known that there's opportunity to develop within blockchain. We've talked about it. We've um, met with others in and outside of networking events, but we hadn't actually put pen to paper and done it because working in a decentralized way is scary. And so he said, "How do we continue doing this?" And when Reach brought the prospect of working, you know, with one kind of domain-specific language. Um, being able to deploy and test very easily. That sounded like something that was more um, amenable to us. It's, you know, a, an approach that allows for a little bit more research rather than you being an expert. And that's really when you're working in the short term and you're working in little bites and pieces, that's something that's a little bit easier to chew. Um, so from our perspective, it was kind of a no brainer. Let's test this out, let's try it. And the more and more we get into here, um, we're able to see those holes and see the things that, you know, we're not great at, but I think, I think every day we're kind of plugging those holes and building the things that we need to be building. And right now that thing happens to be a marketplace. And we started with that, um, mostly because there just weren't, um, from what we saw a whole lot of competition on the Algorand blockchain. And we saw that as an opportunity because, um, as Addy had mentioned, Algorand is super forward thinking. They're building this in a very sustainable, um, you know, measured way. And we said, instead of talking about this, why don't we build this? And instead of it being, you know, a large investment upfront and tons of over oversight and overreach, um, it seemed like something that we could actually break down into smaller phases of work um, and do immediately rather than think about this as a one, two, three year plan. Um, so right now we're building this marketplace. We literally have just started this conversation in the spring and are releasing a marketplace in the summer. And I think all of that has been possible. Um, one, by the way, this, this really great community. And I have to say that I haven't been as deep in the community as I am right now, but the willingness for everybody to talk with one another, to invite people to discussions like this has been really wonderful. Um, and I, I, the more and more I get into it, I, I not only enjoy working with blockchain and NFTs from a technological perspective, but philosophically, just thinking about how we can work together differently and decentralize um, how, how we're managing products and systems. I, it's just something really exciting that we're doing and, and each day we learn a new thing. And we're at that point right now where we're trying to figure out what kind of artists are going to, artists or um, folks that want to creek media are going to be in our marketplace to start. And, you know, there's just so many different, there's more opportunity than we thought there was. So tons of people are interested in NFT marketplaces and they're definitely interested in doing it on Algorand once we kind of tell them a little bit more about um, what they're getting themselves into. For sure. For sure. Um, you hit the nail on the head. Like we're learning something every day you guys just, you know, pick this up in spring and here you're already launching a marketplace. And that's kind of like, that kind of goes back to Chris, like the infrastructure, like what's available, um, the resources available to, to get going. If you're non-technical, even if you are technical, um, you know, you can learn about it pretty quick and, and people are experimenting, which is kind of the name of the game right now. Um, what, I'm, what I'm catching here too, which is going to lead into my next 
topic here is, is really community, right? I'm talking with Addy from the Algorand team. We're talking Aaron over here, a consulting firm uh, that's leveraging the technology. We have Chris over here that's partnering with, with the protocol itself. How, uh, Addy, I'll kick it off with you. Like, how important is community to, to Algorand and, and not only Algorand, but like it's global growth, right? And that could be a community of stakeholders, that's developers, um, you know, the team, the, the, the token holders, whoever the, whatever the case may be. Um, at one point, like I said earlier, like people think they could just develop a blockchain. Yeah. Anybody can build their own blockchain, but like, are, are people going to use it? Right. Is there support there? How important is community to Algorand? Um, and I can tell just by this panel, right. That, that it's pretty strong, robust, and, and you guys are, are engaging the community in a variety of ways. So maybe you could touch on, on kind of how Algorand views that and, and community growth. Yeah, so um, hot take. Um, Algorand is a really young blockchain relative to kind of the competition out there. It's really been, really been out for the last two years. And a lot of what was kind of initially focused on was the technology and ensuring that the technology was really solid and really scalable and really secure. But there wasn't as much focus on the community. So it was this notion, I think, um, of thinking we're going to build the best tech and everyone's going to use it. But with such a saturation in the in the blockchain market right now, um, there was a realization that we really actually had to foster and work a little bit to get people to even realize that we were there because there was so much on the market. Um, so when I initially came to Algorand, a lot of people, you know, hadn't heard about it and they looked into it and they said, oh, wow, this is a really good project. How come it doesn't have any traction? Like, why is no one talking about this project? And um, we spent really the last year focusing heavily on developer outreach, educational outreach, academic outreach, good, you know, um, really strategic hacking, hackers, hacker spaces and hackathons and accelerators that are strategically placed. And we've brought in uh, community ambassadors and developers. And, you know, like Aaron said, um, with the NFT space, we, we've just recently started to develop the standardization for that. And we're trying to, I think, move in parallel with the community rather rather than being behind it or in front of it, but rather working collaborative, collaboratively with um, developers who are, you know, deep into our ecosystem and key stakeholders and investors and everyone else kind of across the gauntlet and really looking at it from like a um, all encompassing sort of taxonomy approach of, of looking at it and working with people and using that feedback and having AMAs and, you know, we're trying to make it not this read only experience, but something where people can contribute and actually see impact within the chain and the ecosystem. Totally, totally. And yeah, those all play critical, critical. There's a lot of moving parts there. Um, and it seems like, you know, you focus on the tech aspect to deliver something. And then and then in parallel, right, then once it's ready, like engaging the community, because, again, blockchain is a peer to peer thing. <laughs> it's a community thing. It's engaging, like proactive, a lot of meetups, you know, tech events, discussions. Chris, so you're kind of in the developer space, like, you know, you obviously are working with uh, with Algorand Foundation and, and their team overall. You know, how important from a developer standpoint um, is community and, and you guys are obviously tackling some of that, right? Being able to onboard is is crucial to get more dApps, more more use cases, more applications. So, yeah, what's your perspective in terms of, of community for like global growth and the importance of, you know, especially around, around in, in blockchain? I mean, one of our company values is that um, without the community, we don't exist. Um, so we want to make sure that we are building things that people use, not building things to just be really smart because we have really smart people on our team and building an amazing piece of equipment that nobody uses is, is pointless no matter how great it is. So community is number one and most important thing. Um, one of the, uh, let's, let's talk about the community a little, a little bit in the actual the crypto space. Um, and kind of go against with what Aaron said. I think the community in general in the crypto space is horrible. Um, I think that it's extremely toxic. I think that uh, crypto Twitter is a cesspool of people waving their flags. Totally. And if you tell me that I'm wrong, you're wrong. I'm sorry. Go read crypto like, Twitter. <laughs> it's horrible. And the reason, why, it. the reason why it's horrible is because they're incentivized to be horrible. Like, the whole like tokenized system is that, um, you know, 
I, if I if I make the other chains feel bad or make people feel bad for liking other chains, my then my number go up. So everybody's out there yelling it across the the borders, telling about how the other ones are bad, and nobody wants a part of that. People on the outside look in and go, "Why would I jump into this?" So this was actually one of the things that we've actually discovered at Reach that. Originally, when we set up, we were like, okay, well, we're going to be blockchain agnostic. So a developer can launch on any chain they want. Maybe they want to launch on multiple chains. And reality is like, yes, that is a feature and people can launch their same application on multiple chains, but not really anybody's going to do that because they're kind of kind of pick one chain and just push there. Um, what we found though, is that that methodology has actually removed toxicity. Because now if you go into the, like the reach community, um, you don't see people waving their Algorand flag or their Ethereum flag or their Cardano flag because it doesn't matter. Developers help developers no matter what chain they're on, and they don't even ask where they're launching because it, like, be- when you remove that that difference at that level, the toxicity goes away because nobody has to wave their flag because developers just have to build, and that's that is my my by far my favorite feature out of all the awesome things that Jay and team has built. My favorite one is that reach has removed the toxicity in crypto. Yeah, no, I like that. I think um, I think it's gotten a little better. Um, I agree with you. Like everything was siloed. There's tribalism, you know, this chain, that chain, and, and there's still some of that. Um, and and maybe some. Uh, th- th- it's still going on. Were, but were, were you just in a, a, a Bitcoin Miami? I don't. I, their their oh, rule man. was you're not allowed to talk about any other um, blockchain at the conference. Yeah. Like. Uh, you're, you're right. That conference was too, too, a little too much. Uh, but the, the crowd, all right, the, the crowd inside was a little aggressive. The crowd outside, you know, m- more open. Uh, sure. that, that's where I was at. But no, totally. I totally agree with that. Um, it's getting better. I will say it's getting better. We're far from where we need to be. Definitely far. And I guess what I was going to go to is like people are building more bridges. I see a lot of more like grant programs, like collaborating. Um, I see a lot more solutions to, you know, be interoperable with, with, you know, other chains. And, and that's all good. I totally agree though, the Twitter and, and kind of that, um, that maxi position, right. Maximalist uh, definitely is around. Um, and, and I, and I'm, I'm hearing a lot more multi-chain and I am hearing a lot more, you know, there's even more chains available, blah, blah, blah. So that's good. Um, so thanks for your perspective on that and, and, and highlighting kind of, some of the drawbacks uh, in crypto um, relating to community is that it is important. At the same time, yeah, there there, there are you know pockets of a uh, lot of pockets within blockchain that you know definitely are against you know it's not very collaborative. And obviously, this is a peer to peer thing, decentralized, so it should be more open. Um, cool, cool. So we'll go to move on here. Um, I, I you know we did bring up NFTs a little bit. Um, you know, Aaron's working on something. Addy's working on something. Uh, let's let's. Uh, I'll start off with, with Aaron here. Is this a trend or a bubble, the NFT space? Um, it's actually gone more mainstream than DeFi. DeFi in the market cap is a little bit, is, is a lot larger, but uh, NFT has actually hit mainstream more and we see it with artists and musicians. But at a high level, like, uh, you know, is NFT, you know, a fad or is it here for the long term? My take is that it's here for the long term. Um, you guys already know that I'm an eternal optimist from my responses earlier. So I, I think it's here for the long haul, um, mainly because I, from a, maybe it's an interoperability perspective is like the developer perspective. Like we believe that if interoperability can be created between all of these systems, like that is, that is the future. Um, and that's what, people want. I think in the NFT space, when we think of interoperability for copywriting, for um, uh, things of that nature that allow artists to kind of take more control over their royalties, I, I think that is here to stay. And I think it would be, it would be hard to go back once you created an avenue um, and interest at a wider scale to operate under that format versus what we have right now. And I think that's just one really, really great and powerful case behind that, that leads me to believe that this is a trend that's here to stay. Um, You know, I think in the DeFi space, using blockchain for a backend for for finances, I think that's also here to stay. So um, I, I would say in the NFT space, you know, from an artist's rights and royalties perspective, we can expect to hear more um, and trends, trending more. 
Yeah. Aaron, awesome. Aaron hit, hit on a really like important part there. I mean, um, she, she said it much more nice gracefully than what I would have. Um, I, I personally believe that the answer is to, is it a fad or is it going to be here for stay is yes. Um, I think it's, it is, there are parts of it that is a fad. I think that the whole dumb, what I call dumb NFTs is something that is going to die um, or go the way of the beanie baby is what I, what I like to say. Um, sure. They're all hot and everything, but then people stop caring and then they, the, the value won't be as high. That being said, like what Aaron really had on is that um, in it, calling an NFT as actually collect, calling a collectible an NFT and only looking at uh, like describing a collectible as an NFT and not really open your mind of what an NFT could be is, is, is too nearsighted. And like Aaron said, tying in royalties, tying in actual smart um, aspects to, to self-sovereign ownership, that is not only is it going to stay, it's going to take over. Like it's this, like you're going to see mm-hmm. where, um, where everything like just ownership in general, when it has to do with P to P is going to be digitalized in a decentralized way because it's, it's cleaner. It's uh, more trusted. It's has lower overhead, everything. Like I, I believe in general that blockchain will be used for every so- every bit of software that has to do with one person interacting with another person or one thing interacting with another another thing. Um, and that's where we're going to get to. And yeah, and to add on to that, I think it's kind of the evolution of this, uh, going back to the peer-to-peer thing, uh, and we'll I'll stick with the artists and musicians, right? Like right now, we, we actually can see a lot of their lives on Instagram, like Facebook Live, right? And where we there's stories and we you know people feel a part of of the of a celebrity's daily life or a high profile and i think this is kind of the evolution on that that peer-to-peer engagement um being able for an artist or whoever to engage their fans their community more directly and removing that middleman right and, and providing some kind of sentiment uh behind the nft eddie what, what i wanted to uh, bring up um was what aaron brought up like interoperability and like nfts um do you think that's like a, a challenge or a hurdle for further adoption? Meaning NFTs right now, are they interoperable? Like, are they only on one chain? Um, do you think we need to open up that standard so that if I have an NFT minted on this chain, I can move it over and be able to, you know, share it more freely as opposed to, you know, being siloed, I guess? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of people working on that. Um, just to address the removing the middleman point though i wanted to say um nfts haven't really done that to be honest the platforms that are primarily established within the market space right now are built out on ethereum so we're paying as artists um depending on the size of the file however many megabytes you're paying up to a few hundred dollars to mint and that doesn't necessarily equate to selling so right there, you're already operating at a loss. And then some of those platforms are taking anywhere from 10 to 30%. And then if you're represented by a commercial gallery that's in the physical world and not the metaverse, um, they want their cut too. So then you're looking at them wanting another 30 to 50%. So it's really not disrupting anything. Like from a traditional artist perspective, if anything, it's just it's another platform to sell your your work, but it's not necessarily democratizing it. The same artists that are doing well with NFTs were doing well before with commercial sales. So it's just retranslating sort of what was physically possible like pre-COVID to a COVID friendly market space. And I think COVID was sort of the perfect storm in the fact that um, I was consulting NFT uh, spaces the year before COVID started and nobody got it, nobody understood why you would do that. And then COVID hit and it was in with like a few months, suddenly everybody's selling on the NFT spaces because the art fairs and Basel and the exhibitions and museums, everything was shut. So it was like, okay, well, if we're gonna make it as artists, like we've got to pivot, we've got to be flexible. So what are we gonna do? And then at the same time, these platforms had the ability to pay with fiat. So you didn't necessarily have to have an understanding of you know crypto. Um, and it was an instant community, like it was a social network uh, foundation, for example, is basically a social network that's like mask as an NFT site. So it allows you to link people. It shows you who's bought the works of the artist. There's this whole like networking social social aspect to it or social capital. Um, that's quite interesting to me. 
Uh, regarding the interoperability, I think the interoperability is the future and the projects that blockchains or market spaces, for that example, wallets um, that don't address interoperability will essentially become um, less competitive in the market space, if not completely obsolete. So I think that's something that if chains want to sustain themselves, they need to look at how to communicate with each other. Um, and with wallets and kind of apps and different mechanisms like DEXs, for example. So I, I'm going to add to what Addy just said, because I, mean, I think you can. Yeah, you know, she, you know, she, she, she had a lot to say there, which was really good. Um, uh, you know, so, across, the, across the board too. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So what I would say is that, yes, um, interoperability is a future. I mean, so much so that it's in Reach's roadmap to actually solve generalized uh, state sync. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Like we haven't hit the limit to what we can do today. And if we talk about it in this way to be like, oh, well, what about interoperability? Everything is, it will only actually hurt the growth of something that doesn't need to be hurt yet. Like we, uh, like this is a, a, a theoretical limit that nobody has actually felt the pain of yet. Totally. Um, I mean, you think about it, like we've lived with different databases forever. Yep. Um, the, the idea of like, you know, different chains is way less uh, restrictive than that alone. So yes, I will believe that. I mean, I do believe that a, you know, a multi-chain future and the interoperability and, you know, like I said, generalized state sync, because I don't believe, believe bridges are actually the answer, is the actual future. But stop. Let's, let's stop theoretically say, killing something that isn't ready to be killed yet. I mean, there's still so much growth in, the, in what we could do right now without any of those functionality, that, that functionality. Yeah, I agree. I think we get ahead of ourselves, almost like kind of uh, a little bit on the, the, you know, transaction speed and all this stuff like scalability and throughput. Uh, we have hit some of those challenges, but overall, there's still a lot of room for us to. But like, know, so, but that's, but that alone, like, for example, like what I'm going to pitch what Aaron's been working on. Um, like you're going to, they're going to be able to launch a, a launch, a NFT through their marketplace for under a penny. Yeah. Like we're not talking about hundreds of dollars. Like this, no. this is not, this is not something that's like, like, like the way that, um, you know, the current, like the, the lazy minting thing was only a bandaid. Like, and it's a bandaid that is like, is looked at as a feature now, but it's only a feature when it costs, you know, hundreds of dollars to launch, you know, with, uh, with Aaron's NFT marketplace, when you can launch, for a for under a penny, who cares really uh, if you if you'd sell or not? I mean, if you don't sell it, it's now just transferred to yourself. And now you have ownership of it, and you can give it to your grandma if you wanted to. I don't whatever oh. you want. Um, do you think kind of the NFT this NFT space is like another ICO wave? Like, is it just another vehicle you think to raise money? Um, you kind of mentioned it earlier a little bit, Chris, in terms of like, I don't know. The risk still associated, you know, if you weren't a top selling artist before, an NFT is not going to get you there. So that might, you know, I don't know, have, have some drawbacks there. But um, yeah, so I think like, I don't know what Aaron on your side, like, who are you guys trying to target, I guess, uh, with this marketplace and how has it been going so far? Uh, you guys are right in the thick of it. Um, you know, you just started doing some research in R&D this past spring, and now you're building it out. Um, you know, who are you guys targeting? Like, I kind of, you mentioned a little bit on artists or musicians. Like, is this an open platform for anybody to, to join and, and launch and, and sell, buy and sell? To start, this is an open platform for any anyone to join. Um, we're complete opportunists. We are, you know, searching in our own network at some, sometimes just the people that we come across in the blockchain community and um, just kind of seeing what fits to start. And then the hope is that over time we kind of refine um, what that might mean or we keep it every man. We're just, we're learning as we go. So um, we, we're trying not to do anything too hastily, but we're starting wide and then I think our goal is to kind of refine and narrow from there. And you, and you guys are a uh, advisory firm. Do you guys get clients like talking about NFTs or tokens in general? And what what are you seeing kind of because you're a general tech advisory firm, right? You guys do quite a few things, quite a few things internally. So 
what's kind of the discussions happening uh, inbound from clients, you know, interest? I think we're seeing a lot of curiosity. I think people are almost a little surprised that we're working on blockchain in some respects. Um, and they want to know more. They're curious about it. I think, yeah, there is this perception in some respects that it's kind of the wild, wild west and it can be toxic and it can be dangerous. And so they're wondering why we're taking these tasks on. And, you know, our answer is, you know, almost the same as everything that we do. It's, it's research. Um, we'll never truly know the bounds of it until we get started and get our feet wet. And sure. we're complete opportunists and came, have come upon reach and have built a relationship um, with reach. And it seemed like a way to tip, dip our toe into something without putting in a huge, huge investment. And here we are doing this experiment with Algorand, not compromising our own. I tricked you, sucker. <laughs> say, say more. I, I tricked you. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> We're in. Um, yeah. You know, I'm really enjoying it, um, mostly because I don't, you know, there may be, you know, there's tons of things that are, you know, come to mind, not safe for work, uh, potentially nefarious, you know, financial behaviors and things like that. But that that really existed everywhere in everything that we do. And we've, you know, had to kind of walk around that and, and come up with a way uh, to make this accessible and valuable to everybody. So we look at it as a research and a UX problem. Um, and we're not necessarily looking at it as an Ethereum or Algorand or other blockchain problem. One, one thing that I wanted to bring up and, and add in, maybe I'll get your perspective too, Chris, was you brought up metaverse and like physical world. Where does NFTs fall in line there? Like I've heard people say like they believe NFTs is like native to the internet um, and shouldn't really be applied to the physical world. Where are you at on the spectrum of, of where NFTs fall in line, you know, between, you know, these two kind of worlds? <clears throat> Am I starting? Or <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you had brought up meta you had brought up metaverse. Opinions. I want to hear yours first, Andy. Yeah, you had okay. you had brought up metaverse and physical world, and I've had other discussions, right? And and I've had people say like, oh, this is only like a, a an internet native uh, concept, right? As opposed to real estate or or applying it to art. Um, anyways, so maybe what are your thoughts there in terms of like where NFTs fall and is it a hybrid? I mean, can it be used for both? Um, I mean, I think from an artistic perspective and sort of an internet life main perspective, um, when something new is created, it's often resisted because there's not necessarily a language to describe it or contextualize it. So initially metaverses were used and for people that don't know what those are they're like 3d online environments that you can build um think like minecraft you can basically build buildings and, and place objects in those and you can and a lot of galleries have done nft exhibitions and, and metaverses um but i i see nfts and metaverses for that matter being kind of like if i relate it to the web it's like pine mail and the terminal and there's this huge kind of future possible of like Chris was saying, smart NFTs, how NFTs are being used, what, you know, if they open access, if there's secondary functionality, once you possibly buy an NFT uh, from a creative perspective, at least um, royalties um, circumventing the galleries. I mean, there's a, there's a whole like model there that hasn't been explored. And I think, because the primary market spaces that have sort of been adopted by artists and musicians specifically have been on one chain with that chain's limitation. And now it's just getting, you know, it's just getting to Algorand, it's just getting to Tesla, it's just getting to Kasama, like whatever other layer ones are that are kind of looking at NFTs and adopting them. Um, and that will bring a completely new kind of ecosystem. And I think user base to some extent to the NFTs and the functionality of that. And that will also then, like um, like with Reach, it's going to bring in a whole community of developers who are then thinking about NFTs in a new way and in, in developing for new spaces. It, whoever says that they're not for the real world it, is silly, um, because like digital rep, like ownership exists in the real world today. Your title, copyright, trademark, supply chain, 
there's stacks of paper places that say who owns something in a digital world, but in a horrible way. Yeah. Like there's, you have to pay lots of money in title insurance in the United States because they're probably going to mess up. Like, like, so to people say, Oh, it's not, it's only for that. It, well, guess what? You are living in a physical world that tries to do this in an absolute horror way that the blockchain is a perfect example on how to do it better. So yeah, I mean, come on. Like, and, and, of course and, it's already hybrid. And, uh, and th- that's a good point in terms of, um, <clears throat> you know, we kind of hear NFTs only in like the art world and musicians, you know, um, th- this type of, in- these types of in- entertainment and media, but you're right. There's supply chain. I think there's a couple projects right now that are leveraging data, data privacy, you know, and NFTs. Um, like, and I think so- the problem is that, so the, the word NFT, non-fungible token, does, that doesn't mean art, collectible. That All that means is a asset that is not dividable. Totally. And like, really, what does that mean? It's like, okay, well, if it's an a, a item that's not dividable, that's ownership of a thing. So it's just a, like, NFT is just self-sovereign ownership and um, ownership in general. So anything that you can own could be represented by an NFT. Any thoughts here, Aaron, on like kind of NFT, you know, the metaverse, digitally native to the internet, um, you know, physical world, tokenizing art, cars, buildings, it's all applicable. I think it's all applicable. I think, I think it's a token. It's representation. I think if we can think about, you know, anything that we have on the internet as, you know, uh, <laughs> a placeholder for a real world conversation, anything, yeah. I, I think we can think about lots of different communications like that. Um, you know, I always think it's going to be better to like see and feel it in space and time but there's only so much space and there's only so much time right around you. Um, and so I think, I, think that this, I think that this all makes sense and I think it will be natural to people. It's just new. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Like uh, generational a little bit. Obviously I'm used to having things tangible, like, you know, it, it's going to be like, um, you know, a, 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 new, a new wave, a new business model, new avenue, new channel. Chris, one thing that I wanted to ask you was, What's going to happen to the physical items? So like we tokenize everything uh, almost like a CD. Like, do we not care about the physical item because we have access digitally to it? Um, and what happens, I guess, to these, these uh, you know, physical items? So it, it really depends on which physical item. I mean, you can't really yeah. do away with a house. Uh, you have to <laughs> live somewhere. Um, but like, I mean, one of the things that, that I always say is that blockchain is boring when you apply it to existing things. Um, a lot of people right now are thinking like, okay, how, what can we do For to sure. decrease the cost of this normal thing? Totally. Um, and boring, who cares? That's just technology. Yep. What makes me, what gets me out of the bed in the morning is when new things are created because of blockchain. And one of the new things that are, that is created because of blockchain that's, that we're going to get there is, um, is tradable, resellable digital goods like MP3s, video games. There's th- that market does not currently exist with blockchain with NFTs. I after I get done playing the latest Super Mario, um, and I'm no longer playing it, and I bought it digitally, I can then sell that to somebody else, and I could lose my my ability. That does not exist today without blockchain. Um, flash loans, not something that exists today without blockchain. Um, this is what is going to be the thing that is going to take blockchain from this thing for nerds to everybody. Um, so to answer your question, like, what do you do with the physical thing? It really depends if you can move it to the blockchain 100% or not it's blockchain because you know, the inefficiency of blockchain, but if you can move, move it to the digital world and still retain this, the, the physical properties of it, then 100% will go in there, but there'll be things like a car. Um, but even, even like things like, um, physical art, um, the benefit of, of putting a a unique item on the blockchain that is a real world thing is sure it exists in the real world, but provenance, um, being able to actually uh, to have auctions to actually resale all of this stuff can exist in the blockchain and be tied to a real world thing. And like there are actually companies out there right now that are are specializing in ways to to tag physical items 
in a very unique way that can't be replicated so that you can actually bind it to the blockchain. So it really depends on like, so to, to summarize all my ramblings up, um, if you can replicate the physical properties of the thing fully digital, then it'll, the physical item will go away. If you can't, the physical item will still be there, but it will still be an enhanced version of it because of the blockchain. Yeah. And you're right. I've had a lot of discussions um, in terms of, in terms of uh, yeah, blockchain. Are we applying it to legacy and traditional systems and trying to innovate there? You know, maybe it's uh, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. But we the innovation is is still ahead of us, and right, and and we haven't even thought about like DeFi wasn't around, right? Um, and then a lot of these other uh, applications weren't around, like you said, flash loans weren't around. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out what, what the future looks like. We can obviously get a glimpse now. Um, two last questions. Um, Addy, I want to ask you a question. You're pretty involved um, on the like ecosystem growth and like projects. And, and what are you seeing nowadays? Um, you know, we have people tuning in and we've all weathered the storm through ups and downs, you know, bear markets, bull markets, uh, all the above. And like, ultimately, you know, during the, the, uh, the downtime, the, the, the bear markets, a lot of projects like become successful. you actually, even in, uh, in history, right. Your, your, uh, Netflix is your Ubers, right. They've all came out of, uh, you know, trying times, right. Like market downturns and a lot of the success, your Facebooks, you know, all came out, raised money. What are you seeing kind of in the Algorand ecosystem in terms of, uh, DAP development, startups, projects, the quality of teams, um, I'd like to really just paint a picture, right, of, of what you're seeing on the inflow and, and uh, what people are looking at, what they're getting better at, and, and maybe you can provide, you know, what, what, what you're seeing in the market. Mute. <clears throat> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we've just sort of started to see a lot of NFT projects that have yeah. been signed and are starting to launch right now. So that's one of the first things. Yeah. Right now, in addition, we have a lot of DeFi projects launching. Yieldy just launched about a week ago. They had, last I checked um, a few days ago, they had about 10 million algos staked. Wow. Um, we have Akon who's doing the ORID, which enables essentially enterprise customers to adopt and migrate existing users to Algorand's blockchain. Um, we have a lot of use case specific projects for things like institutional acquisitions or blue chip auctions, um, migration utilities for NFTs from other chains. Uh, we're also looking at um, high level research projects about primarily um, multi-sig keys and storage of cryptographic hashes and that sort of stuff. But I would say in general, like there's a pretty big uptick in DeFi, like that's noticeable in the last few weeks. So people sure. proposing like DEXs and um, different kind of DeFi implementations and DAOs and that sort of stuff. So I think that that's sort of going to be what we're going to see a lot more of in the next few months on Algorand specifically launching. And then from there, I guess we'll see. Nice, nice. Aaron, um, you guys are, you know, do are involved in heavy in tech. What excites you? Do you see a lot of blockchain overlap into some of the other technology stacks that, that you have clients for? Um, what, what are you most excited for moving forward? I'm most excited for the willingness for people to see the value of blockchain outside of all of the perceptions. I think that it's a valid way to store assets, store information. Um, I think it's in a lot of ways more secure. Um, and I just, I feel like because of NFTs, a lot, I'm, I am seeing a lot of other clients just come into tune with those benefits um, for one reason or another. And it's not just about NFTs, but it's about, this is, this is here to stay. It doesn't have just one application or DeFi it has many applications and it's something that we should be looking into. Um, and so people are willing to say their ideas, you know, even if it means how do I do this thing anonymously or how do I have anonymous buyers and things like that? Um, it's stuff that we can and should talk about. Um, and so I'm, I'm just happy that people are willing to talk about blockchain as 
the technology means to solve their problems. You. What about you, Chris? Uh, yeah, um, good points there, Aaron. I think like, you know, it's endless, right? And we're just figuring it out, you know, what, what people want to do, how they want to use it, uh, the curiosity, you know, is going to drive drive that. Chris, uh, what excites you, man? You're, you're pretty heavily involved in the space, uh, pretty active. Um, you know, we've chatted about a few things here, but yeah, what outside of kind of, you know, some of the applications, like what excites you about, about uh, or moving forward? What excites me? That's such an open-ended question. Um, so I think one of the things that excites me the most is the developers are coming. Um, like we opened our doors in September of last year to developers say like, okay, here's, here's the MVP. Um, since then we've onboarded 1200 developers that actually have built applications. Wow. Um, and that's growing around 10% every single week. Wow. Um, and not only are the developers coming, the projects they're building are getting awesomer and awesomer in a short amount of time. To give you an example, we've been running, you know, short, like accelerator type of um, like five week uh, programs. And the first one, people are like, yeah, look, um, Alice and Bob traded things online. Um, and the one that we're going to be launching, um, I think today, um, not sure when this is going to be layered, but uh is like people are, are building full blown decentralized NFT auctions. Yeah. Um, somebody built a um, a fully decentralized sensor resistant Twitter, um, yeah. and they're building these within like you know four to five weeks worth of work. For sure, um, and that excites me because the the if anybody asks you like, what's the next killer app, they, there's no way they could ever answer that. Because the truth is that the the only way to get killer apps is a numbers game. Developers throwing spaghetti at the wall sure. and seeing what stinks sticks. Yep. So you need millions of developers building things as stupid that we think like fart apps, because th the things that you and I might think are stupid, the rest of the world probably will think is awesome. And that's what we're seeing. Yep. Um, like, you know, thousands of developers are coming into the space now building things that I think are silly. But one of them is going to prove me wrong and take over the world. That's what excites me. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we had a development team, you know, years back. And like, this is one of the, the challenges at that time that we realized was the shortage of talent. And we knew like at that point, like, you know, let, let's get involved now and like, let's pivot and, and start building blockchain projects and, and products and solutions. Um, and here we are now, right? Like it's catching up and we knew it was going to catch up and, um, you know, for everybody watching, right, the internet was built on a bunch of protocols and like now we can make a website in a couple hours, right? Uh, where back in the day you had to like code it and, and build it from scratch and, and all that and we're streamlining that blockchain. It's kind of on that same path. We have kind of the, the, the rails, the infrastructure, the protocols being built out. Um, and, and blockchain is just really a buzzword. Like distributed systems has been around for decades, cryptography decades. Um, and so now it's just kind of coming to fruition uh, with, with the rest of technology. Um, and so we're all excited here. Um, so yeah, we kind of went over on time. Um, first of all, I just want to thank all three of you for joining, uh, participating. Uh, let me go around real quick. Aaron, where can people learn more about, about Cantina and, and you know find get some updates and insights on what you guys are doing? Uh, you can learn more about Cantina on the internet. Um, <laughs> it's a little thing. I don't know if you heard of it. Yeah. Um, we are at cantina.co. Um, there are multiple places to reach out to us there. You can also reach us on Twitter um, to hear more about the blockchain projects that we're working on. Um, we'll be releasing content with Algorand on Twitter and likely on Reddit. And stay tuned. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Chris, where can people learn more about Reach, yourself, your team, and get some you know, updates and insights? Sure. So um, our websites are reach.sh. Um, our Discord is very active. Um, if you ask a question, you will get an answer, um, either from our team or from the community. I and um, on that, definitely. and uh, I would say that if you are currently building or want to build on the blockchain and you're not using Reach, you're doing it wrong. So quick, stop what you're doing, throw it away. You'll be back up to where you are and further along within a matter of days. So just come on, join the team, join the community, and let's build, build real cool stuff.
Awesome. Awesome. Last but not least, Addy from the Algorand team, uh, one of our uh, proud sponsors and, and supporters of, of the conference, um, which ultimately the funds get used to produce this quality of content. And not only that goes back to, you know, our student programs and all that. So Addy, where can people learn more about, you know, you, your team and, and get some more information? Yeah, um, also on the internet. So uh, algorand.foundation is our website. You can see um, different funding models we have, diluted, non-diluted, um, what kind of research is going on, access to our GitHubs. Uh, we have a pretty active Twitter, it's Algo Foundation, and a, a pretty active Discord as well. And if you have any developer questions that are specific, I recommend you hang out there. You can find me there pretty much as long as I'm awake. Uh, Chris is around sometimes too, so feel free to DM me there. Awesome. Awesome. I'll go ahead and uh, conclude here for everybody tuning in to reimagine 2021. Hopefully you enjoyed the discussion. We chatted about NFTs. We've chatted about interoperability. We chatted about Algorand and kind of the benefits and, in, in, you know, the community and resources available to them. And that's kind of the point of this discussion for everybody trying to figure out what blockchain to use. There's many options, but ultimately um, you will understand kind of why people are developing on a certain chain. And this is kind of proof right here, a uh, strong community, good bond, resources, education content, uh, grant programs, um, accelerator programs. Um, those are all crucial, right? So uh, again, thank you all for tuning in. Chris, Addy, Aaron, we hope to have you guys back sometime in the future and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adam. Thanks, guys.